Well, what a journey we've been through with Ezra and Esther up till now. And tonight will be no different. Last week, if you remember, we started off speaking about them. We spoke about those that stayed in Babylon at the time that chose not to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And we also considered their nature. We considered just how they had mingled and merged with the environment that they were in, that they had taken on the character and also the custom of the people that they were with. We also saw that because of that, they were worshipping God with their mouth, but their heart was far from Him. We also saw that what they decided to do was be armchair worshippers, that they financed those that went away. And specifically, we looked at the two characters, which was Mordecai and Esther, because in retrospect, it was Mordecai which contributed significantly to the attitude and to the hatred that was aroused by Haman. And we also considered the fact that it was not just sufficient to express a belief, and that's what they were doing. They were quite happy to sit in the background and let everybody else do the work. And then we considered our good friend Haman, who because of the impulsive nature of the king, Ahasuerus or Exerces, who took no time to do any due diligence whatsoever into who Haman was guarding him to exterminate. He merely just went through blindfolded and handed his ring through to Haman to expedite a decree which would, in retrospect, put an entire nation to death. And it's interesting that this was one of the characteristics of this king. If you look through all the historians, he was known for this. He was not a man that was known for doing a lot of due diligence. He would act impulsively. And as a result, the decision that he actually took, he was totally oblivious to the fact that, well, his new king, the woman that found favor in his sight, new queen, that is, sorry, the woman that found favor in his sight, was going to be affected by that very decision that he, he had allowed Haman to implement. <coughs> and we saw that Haman was one of those people. It was just about me, 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 me. Everything was about me. He was driven by the insatiable desire for power. He was greedy. He was fabulously rich, and I suppose that contributed towards his attitude and more the fact that when Haman was snubbed by Mordecai. And when Haman found out that Mordecai was a Jew, this raised a whole new level of opposition because he knew what the Jews were like. And he had a historical aspect in relation to the Jews. And then we saw that, well, Haman was elevated. He was actually elevated to second in command. He was actually elevated even higher than the princes of the day. So this was a man that was gone right from the very bottom to the very top with one quick jump. Talk about climbing the ladder. He certainly did that. But he made one big mistake. Well, made quite a few big mistakes but the biggest one that he made was he went against God's people irrespective of whether they were not living a life that was totally conducive to a life that a person 
that worship God should live, those that were about them, he decided to exterminate and go against a covenant that God had made, going right back to Abraham. And so he went from elevated to a common criminal in one clean move. And then we saw in Esther chapter 7 how that when Haman was exposed by Queen Esther and the wrath of Ahasuerus came upon him, we saw that while the words were yet in his mouth, they covered his head and we saw the amazing types between the Lord Jesus Christ and the situation that we read of in Esther chapter 7. We saw that the time, the time of Adar, which was the actual date that Haman had done through the casting of lots that he was going to exterminate the Jews, which was the 13th day of the 12th month, 1312, that in a Jewish Gematra calculator, it means the Ark of the Covenant. And we know that the Ark of the Covenant has a mercy seat and a covering. And in that very act of that night or that day, when Esther exposed Haman, and he was executed because they hung him on the gallows. And by the way, when I say hung him on the gallows, and there is a top between the Lord Jesus Christ, where the Lord Jesus Christ destroyed sin in the flesh, same as here, sin was destroyed. The Persians, they referred to it as hung on the gallows, but it was impaling. In fact, Exerces' father, or Ahasuerus' father, which was Doris Hestespus, on his Grecian uh, uh, military campaign, he impaled 5,000 men in one day that stood against him. So they were notorious for this. It's interesting that, you know, Haman is mentioned 44 times in the book of Esther. But Haman the Agagot is only mentioned four times. And when you take a look at it, it's four times, the first one being in verse 1 of chapter 3, which introduces this man, Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagot, the enemy of the Jews. We look again, it's in verse 10 of chapter 3 where he gained approval to destroy the Jews. Then he was in verse 5 and verse 3 of chapter 8, where Esther asks the king to overturn the decree. And lastly, in chapter 9 and verse 24, it uses that particular verse to summarize Haman's plot. In reality, what you had was a racial problem and that is why it's mentioned only those three times directly in relation to him because he gets the label as the enemy of the Jews and it is identified as Haman the Agagot and we'll see as we continue on through the rest of this talk just how important that was you see Sometimes we think that God's laws are too harsh. His commandments are too harsh. His statutes are too hard to adhere to. Because what had actually happened was, is Saul was told in 1 Samuel chapter 15 that he had to go out and he had to destroy the Amalekites totally and utterly. And what he did was, he actually com uh, rebelled against God's word in retrospect because he actually had not obeyed God's law to the letter. And Samuel actually tells him that. He says, God said, I've repented of the day that I put Saul as king. Herein lies the problem. Because he disobeyed God's law and because he didn't fill God's law to the very letter, 
You know, it's interesting. 571 years later, there's a remnant from that disobedience that comes back to haunt the children of Israel through the character of Haman. And Haman would have been fully aware of this, just as Mordecai was. Specifically, you'll notice that repeatedly it keeps mentioning the fact and it keeps going back through to Haman's lineage. And so, as a result of that, and as a result, remember, in chapter 3, uh, Mordecai refuses to pay homage to Haman and he admits that he's a Jew. And almost instantaneous, the spiral starts going downwards. So there's this very close association between the fact that Haman is an Agagite and Mordecai is a Jew and the fact that Mordecai refused to pay homage to him. But here, we have a totally different kettle of fish. And we have the situation that we've just read <coughs> in Esther chapter 8, that are not on that day, King Ahasuerus gave the house of Haman the Jews' enemy. You see that title? He's constantly being referred to it. Can you think of another period in Scripture? Remember, Judas, who betrayed Jesus. When it refers to Judas, it talks in the same manner. When it talks about Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. Can you see, there, there are patterns within Scripture which brand a, a person. And Esther, the queen, and Mordecai came before the king, and Esther had told him, told what he was unto her. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman and gave unto Mordecai. And Esther sent Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now here's the interesting thing. In actual fact, the king hadn't given the ring as a possession to Haman. And it was only at the time that he gave the ring for the specific purpose of writing the decree. But here we have a different situation. Here we have him taken off the ring at the outset. And I believe that what you have is you have Xerxes, you have Esther, and you have Mordecai. And when it was revealed to him, he realized that by marriage he was related now to Mordecai he was a brother-in-law so you can see there is this close association and that is why the ring is taken off and given to to Mordecai and there's a difference because Haman when Haman received the ring it was only for the purpose as I said of writing a decree Mordecai receives the ring at the time of elevation and therefore it's it's depicting to us that he was higher in status, specifically in the eyes of the king. Esther receives all Haman's property. Now, what's so important about that? Well, the interesting thing is this. That if you were taken to have conspired against the king, treachery, and you were hung on the gallows or impaled, you were classified as a common criminal and therefore the crown, as it were, confiscated all your property. Everything. But it wasn't just that. They killed your family. And here is a situation where the king is now taking that property of Haman and he's giving it to Esther. Almost, in my view, and my humble opinion, is a sort of an offering of peace for the hardship and the heartache that he'd actually put Esther through. Now Esther puts Mordecai in control. And the association between Esther and Mordecai is revealed to the king as we've read. And here's the important thing. 
the Jewish nationality is no longer concealed. You think about that. What did the Lord, these echoes all over the place. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say? He that is not prepared to witness me and is ashamed of me, I also will be ashamed of him. So there's some echoes all the way through scripture. Proverbs says, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to Yahweh. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. And that was the situation with Haman. You know, I put that title that is never too late to change. Because you think about it, when we look at chapter 4 and at verse 10, when Mordecai first asks Esther to go unto King Ahasuerus to plead for the cause of the people, the Jewish people, and to save them from extermination, she tells him that if you're not called to come before the king, if you walk in, you unannounced, the king actually hasn't asked for you, and you come into his presence, there is but one thing, death. And the king has to actually extend the golden scepter so that you can live. So why is it then, and how is it then, that Esther was able to go before the king? But the interesting thing is, I've heard this many times, well, how come Esther walked in? Well, actually, it doesn't actually say that. It says, and Esther spake yet again. She was already with the king because they had just come back from the feast the, uh, um, that she had with the king and with Haman. And she comes in his presence because that's what they were, obviously in a different location. They'd moved from the place where Esther was having the feast and it moves into the court where he was. And she falls down, irrespective and would have been immediately seen as an act of violation of the rights of any person that is in the presence of the king. But what does the king do? He extends the golden scepter once again. And that's why it's very interesting that that word golden scepter you're going to see this evening that there is an absolute abundance of certification that the Most High God rules in the kingdoms of men, that everything that happens in Scripture is preordained by Him. Three times the word golden scepter occurs in that sequence. In the entire Bible, you're looking at it. Esther chapter 4, Esther chapter 5, and Esther chapter 8. Now what does 3 represent in Scripture? And look, taking it from Bullinger's numbers. He says that there are three dimensions, length, breadth, and height. There is three which stand for solid, real, substantial, complete, and entire omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, omnipotence, that is. And there's past, present, and future. The only three times that he extends the scepter, we have been told, and you'll find that throughout these last three chapters of Esther, there are so many emphatic lessons for us that we can take thousands of years later. And I firmly believe, and I've said it so many times from the platform, there is no such thing as coincidence in God's Word. Every time there is something that's repetitive in God's Word, and when something jumps out at you, you are being told something. Do you remember what the proverb says? It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but it is the honor of kings to search out a matter. What did Esther say to the king? 
How can I endure to see the evil that has come upon my people? Can you see the change? Before it was a, a facade. There wasn't any open declaration of nationality. Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Just consider this. Taking into consideration the aspect of past, present and future. Past, present, future. Just take a look at this. They hid the nationality. Present. They openly declared it. And in the future, all nations would know. They were reluctant. She was reluctant to go to the king. So was Mordecai. Then she speaks totally unannounced. If the king had not lifted up the scepter, it would have meant instantaneous death, irrespective of whether she's the king, queen or not. Then she was always with the king after that. She, they were condemned to death, the Jews that is. They were delivered from death. And then preservation going forward. Sin ruled through Haman. Sin was destroyed. And then it was life to all. Initially, those about them were without God. And they were presently with God. But more importantly, you'll see in chapter 9, they remember God. And you can see it when we are told that the golden scepter was given through three times as an acceptance We'll see just how this lesson comes out because what Esther did was she played what is called the lawyer's game. She looked for a legal loophole in a discussion with the king. She knew, she absolutely knew that a decree could not be overturned. She also knew that the king was feeling pretty sensitive about the matter. So Careful words are used. Very careful words. And this is when we come back to another acrostic. Just look at how she words it. Remember what I told you what an acrostic is? It's either a poem or one letter in a word over a period forms a word. But yeah, you can see it's labeled A and B. If it pleased the king, and if I found favor in his sight, and the thing seemed right before the king, and I be pleasing in his eyes. Can you see how, how the theme fits perfectly? So she was pretty much saying that I know it's not you, it was Haman. She's blaming Haman. And she uses very subtle words. She avoids using the word debt, the Hebrew word debt, which is a decree. She talks about letters. You see how subtly, very cunning. She also doesn't say overturn. He fell. And Abir. She says, I want you to recall them. Just bring them back. I'm not asking you to overturn your law. Just bring the letter back as if it never went out. And in so doing, she's blaming Haman. I know it's not your fault. Let's just correct this. But you see, the king knew all well. He was very uncomfortable with it. And he knew that it was impossible for him to actually call anything back. You take a look from verse 7. Then the king said unto Esther uh, the queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and him they have hung upon the gallows, because he laid his hand upon the Jews. What is actually not really the case. He hanged 
Haman because he came in and he found Haman falling all over his wife and he felt that he has Haman in my own house trying to abuse the queen. And I believe that is put there, I believe that's inspired because it says he laid his hand upon the Jews. Write ye also for the Jews, as it liketh you in the king's name, and seal it with the king's ring. And then he just answers Esther in a very polite way. He's saying, look, I've given you all the property. Everything belongs to him throughout the entire provinces. I want you to take that and do with it what you want. Also, I've given Mordecai full power. He's my second in command. You can write a letter which should be the antitype of the one that Haman wrote. Put a plan in action because the letter that you send, no man can overturn. You can't reverse it. So in a very pleasant way, he was telling the queen, whatever you do, make it good because the first one stands with Haman. Have you noticed? There's a totally new theme. This is not about Haman anymore. This is about Jew. You know the word Jew? It's mentioned 54 times in Esther. And in ver chapters 8, 9, and 10, 40 of those 54 times occurs there. We've been told. And that word, in thy hand, laid his hand upon the Jews. Here's an occurrence of it. Joshua chapter 10 at verse 8. And Yahweh said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. This book, Esther, has got card written all over it. Yes, some of the places where he put forth his hand. I did an algorithm. The exact spacing, exact Hebrew order in the transliteration that occurs. There you're looking at them. But just take a look at what some of those chapters say and Yahweh God the first one said behold the man has become as one of us to know good and evil and now lest he put forth his hand to lay his hand upon and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever what did God do Therefore God put cherubim with a sword that turned in every way to protect the way of the tree of life. What about this? Remember the dove that was going out? It was looking for place to land and it found no rest for the sole of his feet and she returned unto him into the ark for the waters were upon the face of the whole earth and he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her into the ark. You know, brothers and sisters, every single time you look at the little gems that are contained in God's word, I don't believe, just like Paul, when Paul chose to pick carefully selected words, he didn't just pick them randomly. He made specific use of words that he knew had major emphasis on what he was talking about. Just go through a few of them. If a thief be found, be, uh, uh, be not found, then the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges to see whether he hath put his hand unto his neighbor's goods. 
Does it ring a bell? What is Haman going to do? He was going to destroy them. And the king says, Oh, and all their property is yours as well. Haman, thank you very much. Look at this. When the angel stretched out his arm to destroy Jerusalem, or he that putteth his hand upon the rock, he overturneth the mountains by the roots. So this is talking about the power and the, the usage of God by his outstretched arm and a mighty hand. But here, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Uzzah and he smote him. Why? Because he put his hand to the ark and there he died before God. What did Haman do? That's exactly what Haman was doing. And we've seen what the Jumatria means. And if you take a look at the two points highlighted there, we can see that there is this hidden message that's being told to us throughout this chapter. And it will come a little bit more apparent when we start looking at this next slide. The preservation. Because you take a look at how this is actually implemented. In verse 9 of chapter 8, then the king's scribes, then were the king's scribes called at that time, when? In the third month, that is the month Sivan, on the three and twentieth day. From this point onwards, there is a lot of detail and a lot of painstaking, laborious effort on giving dates and times. We have been asked to look deeper into this. When was Haman's decree done? Well, it was done on the 13th day of the first month. So in reality, from the time that Haman wrote his decree to the time that Mordecai wrote his decree was two months, ten days. And that is 70 days. It's interesting that in 70, you've got quite a significant type and quite a significant lesson that is brought out in that. Let's just consider some of them. Jacob took 70 Israelites to Egypt. Seventy years was considered a full lifespan. Three score years plus ten. And if by God's grace, four score. Seventy years exile till the return to the land. And you can see, seventy years because they were taken captive on B.C. 606. And at B.C. 536, the first of the exile with Shezbeza went through to Jerusalem. 70 years to the month. I can't say to the day because I wasn't there. But there's the second 70 years, which was the fulfillment of the building of the temple. And why is that? Because in 586, the temple was destroyed. And in 516, the temple is rebuilt. 70 years. Two 70-year cycles. B.C. 606 to B.C. 536. B.C. 586 to B.C. 516. Here's the other important thing. This is why I say that Haman made one big mistake. Because the 13th day of Nisan was only two days before the Jews celebrated the Passover. What they were doing is... God had brought them out with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand from Egypt. And he said to them that on the first month, Adar, that you must 
bring an offering of a lamb without blemish, and it shall be for a perpetual lesson through all your generations. And Haman is saying, well, it's not going to happen because on the same day, I'm going to kill everybody. And God says, uh-uh, that's not going to happen. Just, I know this is quite a bit to read. We're not going to read the whole thing. I just want you to focus on the bold. Just take a look. It's the third month, that is the month Sivan, the three and twentieth day. Then he goes to say that it was sent to all the lieutenants and deputies and rulers of the provinces. And he makes it abundantly clear. This is my entire kingdom. This is from India through to Ethiopia. 127 provinces. And then he goes in verse 11, he says, And every Jew can gather themselves together to do what? To stand for life, to destroy, to slay, to cause to perish. And they are entitled to take the spoil. In one day, in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month Adar. It's like almost like deja vu, isn't it? It's just repeat, repeat, repeat. So let's just take a look at this. 3 and 20, 20th day, 23rd day of the third month, 233, it's the day the scribes were called and a decree was proclaimed to save the Jews. The Gematria, 233 means Messiah. The 13th day of the 12th month, the month Adar, when they were supposed to be exterminated, the day that was declared by Pure, which is Lot, by Haman to destroy the Jews, which after it becomes Purim. That means, in a Gematria, the Hebrew calculator, the Ark of the Covenant. The 127 provinces, the decree was sent to fight for life and Purim to be held. You put that in the Chimatra calculator, 127, you know what it gives you? It gives you March 473 BC. That's what it means. What is the month Ada? The month Ada in the Babylonian calendar is the 12th month, which is March. When was Purim officially, officially celebrated? According to the historians and according to all the genealogies, guess what? BC 473. So it doesn't matter which way you look at it. You go from Purim, Meaning, and it, the word 100, and 127 means BC 473, 473 in March. Ada means February or March. Purim was done in 473. Even if you work backwards, still means the same thing. Doesn't matter how you look at it. Look at the word assembled, gathered. You know what the word gathered means? It means to assembly. Assemble yourself. It means a congregation. It's the same word that is actually used in the New Testament of synagogue, which is in from out of that comes the word ecclesia. They were to gather themselves and what? Stand for life. Can you see the message that we've been told you? And what else did they get? They got rest. You know, it's interesting, that word rest. It's the same word used of the ark when it came to rest on Mount Ararat. And why did it come to rest? Because God had looked upon on man, and the heart of man was desperately wicked. And he says, I will destroy man from the face of the earth. And he brings a flood, and he cleans the whole world of evil. 
And of that entire population, only eight people are saved. And then it comes to rest when the water's abated. You know what 1, 3, 1, 4 means? The 13th or the 14th? It mean, doesn't mean Yahweh. It means Yahweh. It's the same word that was in the acrostic that we looked at last week. The word Purim. The word Purim, they were to hold Purim on the 14th and the 15th day. Why? Because it was a time period when the Jews had rest from their enemies. And they were to remember when sorrow was turned to joy and gladness. Do you know what 14, 15 means? Yahweh who sees. What does the proverb say? The eyes of Yahweh are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Now put this in a earth shape just so that you can under understand and see just how it flows you've got 127 provinces 127 in the Gematria tells you that it is March BC 473 Haman's decree was the 13th day of the first month two months 10 days to Mordecai's decree 70 days. Mordecai's decree was the 3 and 20, 20th day. In other words, 23, 23rd of the third month. And that means Messiah. So guess who is at the center of this entire top that will be shown? The Savior that was being brought to bring the Jews out of the hand of the most lethal and vicious decree put against the extermination of not only men, women, children, everything that was declared they had to be killed. Do you know, if you look at that 127, March, BC 473, there we get it. The month Adar, 473, and that leads to the time when the Purim was going to be celebrated. And what is Purim? On the 13th or the 4th. And who, what does that mean? Yahweh. And then we go from the Purim feast, which is the Ark of the Covenant. And lastly, at the center, which was the day that the Jews were told to remember and to rest and to celebrate the Feast of Purim. This was on the 14th and the 15th day. As a memorial, it says. The 14, 15 means Yahweh who sees at the center. This is absolutely incredible. God's fingerprint is all over Esther. I was astounded when I first looked at it, because I couldn't really see any evidence. But the closer I looked, it just comes out of the woodwork. You know, that word gather, it only occurs a few times in Scripture, in the Old Testament. It means to assemble, to be gathered together. But you can see, it's the word with the the red dot, it's qual. But it comes from the root word, which is qual. And it means an assembly or convocation or congregation. What they did was they got together because there's strength in unity. And there's an echo back to Exodus chapter 12. What were the Jews told on the Passover? If your house is too small, go to your neighbor or get your neighbor to come to you. Because there had to be fellowship. And they were being told here that they had to have fellowship on that particular day because they were going to be delivered. You know, take a look. 
at where they were and where they've come to. When we speak about them, initially they were worldly in a sense of the word. But Yahweh says, turn to me, saith Yahweh. And the more they go from further away from the worldly aspect and start getting closer to God, the blessings increase. The separation between what they used to be and what they are now increases. You take a look. They were in assembly. Why? Because they had turned from the old ways. They stood for life in that assembly. And as a result of that, what did they get? They got rest. But not only that, they got gladness. And then Yahweh brings about joy. You know, in verse 16, it says the Jews not only had gladness, they had light. In God is no darkness, only light. And they had gladness. Can you see the green that the two are associated? And you know the interesting thing about having light and gladness and joy and gathering together and having fellowship and separating from the world and turning towards God, it's contagious. You want to know why? Because there were many people in the land that became proselyte Jews. They became Jews because fear had fallen upon them. God works through this entire book with one objective in mind, the preservation of his people, bringing out a people for his name and destroying sin in the flesh. Psalms say this, Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, Yahweh have done great things for them. And Yahweh has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Yahweh, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, beareth precious seed, shall doubtless come again worth rejoicing. But the other Jews that were in the king's provinces gathered themselves together and stood for their lives and had rest from their enemies. You know that word rest? It occurs just four times in the entire Bible. Believe it or not. That particular word. Three times are in Esther. One time is in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and verse 41. And we have to look at this, I'm sorry. Because you know when the time was? It's the time that David has moved on. And Solomon is instructed to build the temple. And look what he says. But Yahweh said to David my father, For as much as it was in thine heart to build a house for my name, Thou didst well in that it was in thine heart. Notwithstanding, thou shalt not build the house. Skip down. In verse 11. And in it, where? In the house. I've put, what? The ark. Wherein is the covenant of Yahweh that he made with the children of Israel. And he stood before the altar of Yahweh in the presence of all the congregation, the gathering. And spread forth his hands. Yet, verse 37, if they bethink, and I put that there because that word bethink doesn't quite jump out at you what it means. 
But there's two Hebrew words. It's one of those words that is a combined word. It's made up of Shem Vav Bet and it's made up of Labav. Now what those two words put together mean is this. Is that they caused themselves to turn in their heart back to God. That's what it means. Now, in this particular period, what Solomon's doing is he's praying for the people that are in exile. Look what he says. If they turn back their heart away from their own thinking and back to God, in the land where they are carried captive and turn and pray unto you and say, we have sinned, we have done amiss, we have dealt wickedly, return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity, whether they have carried them captives and pray towards what? Towards the land. He was making reference to the house. That house that was destroyed. That house that who? Shezbaza, Zerubbabel and Jeshua had finished building in BC 516 in Jerusalem. He's telling you, I want you to look back to that land, which is my house. And I want you to rem remember that. And he goes on to say that. Towards the city which thou hast chosen and towards the house which I have built. For thy name. Then hear from heaven. Maintain their cause. Forgive thy people that have sinned against thee. Let I beseech thee. Thine eyes be open. That thou now therefore arise, O Yahweh God, in thy resting place. Thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests, O Yahweh God, be clothed with salvation. And let thy saints rejoice in goodness. So when it talks about rest and gladness, it is giving us the parallels that we can either take to heart and the lessons that Solomon had given. Or we can look at Christ makes it as an example. Because what he's doing, he's speaking about them. And when I say about them, you know who I'm talking about. Those who stayed in, in Babylon. He makes a parallel here. Jesus says that this man was so focused on his wealth that all he wanted to do was build bigger and better, get more and more money. And the more money that he got, the further that he got away from God. That's exactly what they were doing there. And he says that, well, what will I do? Well, I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. There's that word, rest. Eat, drink, and be merry. And what happens? God takes a laugh from him. Can you see there? Ease or rest and rest. What they were and what they are now. That's what they used to be. But now they've changed. They're in God's realm now. And God, as Solomon says, will hear their call. You know, Jesus continues on to say, he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and what? I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. There's a theme that runs through this entire book of Esther. It's quite incredible. You know, when we look, at Ahasuerus and Vashti, and we look at Esther, and we look at Mordecai, and we look at the father of Esther, who was Abihail, who died, and Mordecai took over, bringing her up. 
just in those names alone, Esther, she is hidden. Mordecai, a little man, bitter, bruising, bruising, bitterly reduced. And Abihail, father of might. My father is strength. You see, I found this particular translation of this chapter 9 and verse 9 the best, which is the Revised Standard Version, because it says, In the twelfth month, and which is the month of Adar, and the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out on the very day when the Jews, the enemies of the Jews, hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. I find it staggering that. The, the King James Version doesn't give it that sort of impact. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. They went all out. <laughs> it's a total ambush. But here's the thing. Not this time. They were told by the king, you can take their spoil. It says three times. There's three again. Complete. But on the spoil laid they not their hand. They weren't going to make the same mistake that Saul had made with the Amalekites by taking of the spoil. This time, same as Saul says to uh, Samuel says to Saul, "Have you utterly destroyed them?" Well, no, we haven't. We would not utterly destroy all of them because we kept some of it for, for God. That's who we really kept it for, is for God, not for us. And, God, and Samuel says to him, don't you know to obey is better than sacrifice? Don't you know that? You know, Malachi... We're inclined to think that, well, what's Malachi doing here? What are you doing, Vincent? Well, actually, Malachi is contemporary with this period. Malachi's ministry is B.C. 500 to B.C. 460. Slap bang in the middle of this. And he uses the example of the Levites. And he says to them, to, to those that are around, you shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith Yahweh of armies. Now, the interesting thing is, the reason why he was using Levi is because of those that were back in Jerusalem that were involved with false wives. And taking other people's wives from other nations. And he used Levi as an example because I thought this is quite amusing actually. It was the period when Moses went up the mount to fetch the Ten Commandments. And Moses comes down and Joshua says, There's a sound of war in the camp. And they go down and they look and they see this golden calf. So he goes up to the high priest, which is Aaron, and he says, what did this people do? And this is the English Standard Version. It has a way of putting words. So I find it quite amusing, some of it. What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? It's, it's you, Aaron. And he says, let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know this people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. So I said unto them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me. And I threw it into the fire, 
And out came this cough. I have no idea where it came from. Isn't it funny? And what does Moses say? Who is on Yahweh's side? And the Levites gathered themselves to them. And what does he tell them to do? He says, take every man his sword and go out and slaughter. Is there an echo here to Esther? When he talks about remembering and that day, we are told, shall be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city, and that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish. This is a dead ringer for Exodus chapter 12. You know, before and after, it's the Hebrew word yad. It's the same word, remembered, or memorial. They're both the same word, Yad. But what we've been told here is this. You can either remember what you were like and stay like that, or you can remember what you've come to and what you aspire to now in God's presence. And I'm going to give you two examples of the word doesn't occur much times in the Bible. The first one is of Samuel, in Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 18, about Absalom. What did Absalom do? Now, Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar, which is in the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And it is called unto this day Absalom's place. But then in Isaiah 56, it talks about a different type of remembrance. For thus saith Yahweh unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant, even unto them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place. There's your word. A remembrance a place and a name better than sons and daughters and I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Can you see the difference? There's an association. We have a, we have a pivotal point up at the top where Yahweh is and it comes down like this and we are both sides of the spectrum where we were and what we are. And we can't cross the plane. Remember what Jesus said about Abraham? There's a great plane separating us. You know the difference was? At that time it was all about them. But at that time it's all about God. That's the difference. As truly as I live, we have a time now of relative peace. It's a time that God has brought His people from the mire, taken them out from the apostasy, brought them into a new and living hope. And they are going nicely in favor with God. It's almost like deja vu. BC 473, Purim. BC 458, an important date. You know why? It's the date that Ezra takes the second lot of exiles to Jerusalem. It's the first time Esther, Ezra actually goes to Jerusalem. It is 28 years from when Esther became queen. Time for the old habits to creep in. But I don't believe it crept in with those that were in Shushan. Because you know why? Because es Ezra was there and so was Nehemiah. 
And both of them were sent as pillars to go sort out the mess that was happening in Jerusalem. So I believe that those that didn't initially go to Jerusalem and had to learn the hard way actually held fast. And even though they were trialed, they had the depth there to be able to send a ready scrub and a one, uh, the one person <laughs> uh, that, that gave the one to the king. He went, Nehemiah. And that's the beauty of it. God says there is no new thing under the sun. Man has this incredible behavior. He gets brought out of the Maya. God delivers him. He goes through all this beautiful joy and gladness. And then what happens? The longer he is in that comfort zone, he starts slipping. And then God's got to bring them back up again. And that is what's happening because we take the journey then and we go with Ezra back with the exiles, leaving Babylon to go with Ezra to the city of the great king, back to Jerusalem. Because he was a ready scrub, skilled in God's law. And just for clarification, you can see there. 458, Ezra leaves a group of exiles. At that time now, remember, Xerxes is gone. And his son, Artaxerxes, is reigning in his place. So, closing off. Ezra went up from Babylon. And he was a ready scrub. And what I know that those that were back there, that we spoke about them so much, that they had learned from their lesson, is because it tells us that the good hand of his God was upon him. Suddenly God's in the picture. Openly. That tells me that we don't have to dig to see God's hand in this anymore. It's openly declared. It's the same as those that were about them hid their nationality and in the end exposed it to all the nations. When we think about it, we consider what we have been told. One, we have a sure word of prophecy. It is incredible what we can read of in Scripture and how can we can take a look back in the past and see it happening in our very lives. God's word has emphasis has to be the guiding force in our life. It's not easy. And every single one of us will fail. But we have to have His Word as our guiding force. We have to put our trust in God. Is anything too big for God, we have to ask? Mordecai would have asked himself many a times. The answer is no. This is closely associated with the fact that we have to trust in God. God will never forsake those who follow his commandments. God is preserving a people for his name. It's never too late to change. Because God's hand is always extended to us. And no matter what we are faced with in life, no matter what we are faced with in life, and this is where we fall short. Just like Mordecai, where we tend to think that our problem far exceeds the capability of our God. 
to intervene and to solve. No matter what we are faced with in life, God will deliver. If, well, if we put our trust in God. That's the theme of this chapters 8, 9, and 10. It's about trust. It's about faith. It's about knowing that no matter how dire the circumstances are, that everything may seem totally pointless and totally unsolvable, God will resolve it. But we need to allow our trust in God and His Word in us to grow. But we must never ever let it go from grow to go.